Yes, we have a test on Friday. Exam free. You're in the in-class class, so you will be taking it Friday here at 9 o'clock and going as usual at 10.45. Uh, the online class talking to you, uh, you can take it Friday either at 7 a.m. if you can get up at early or 2 p.m. And the options for Thursday are 8, 8 a.m., 10 a.m., 12 noon, and 2 p.m. What does it cover? See, I was initially thinking we hadn't done too many sections, but we've done more sections than I thought. I've listed out the sections. We've only done through chapter four so far. A tiny bit, about a few minutes of chapter five last Friday. Uh, so chapter three, 3.5, that is about um, the zero eigenvalue case and repeated eigenvalue case. I'm not going to test you on the repeated one, other than just knowing that it, it exists. Um, and when you cross the repeated root parabola and the trace determinant plane, that that is a repeated eigenvalue case. You should know that. But as far as finding the formula for the solution, I'm not going to test you on that. 3.6 is about you know what's the difference between underdamped, critically damped, and overdamped harmonic oscillators at 3.6. Section 3.7 is the trace determinant plane, looking for bifurcations. 3.8 is three-dimensional linear systems, which you only touched on. And I did say you should know the basic idea that if I give you the eigenvalues and the corresponding eigenvectors, you should be able to write down the general solution and solve initial value problems, though I'd have to give you a fairly easy initial value problem. So the system of equations you'd solve for k1, k2, and k3 would not be too complicated. Chapter 4 is about force harmonic oscillators. 4.1 is about exponential. Um, forcing function, which is not real practical, but it's simpler to think about and is sort of a warm-up for the more practical sinusoidal forcing functions, which is what sections 4.2, 4.3, and 4.4 are all about. Chapter 5 uh, gets into nonlinear systems again, and what we'll talk about for the most part today is what's called linearization. Um, that is going to be in the test. These, the kinds of problems in these sections are pretty long and difficult. I will do things to try to make them easier for the test. So you want to get the basics down, and hopefully with my help, that will still help you do the test. For example, I might draw the no clines in 40 to save some time on the test. We're trying to draw phase planes, draw them accurately as well as we can by hand. That's, that's sort of the, the goal we're at. And we want to understand why the phase planes look the way they do. I do want to wrap up some things in chapter 4 here about forced harmonic oscillators. We've been dealing only with the right-hand side that was cosine omega t. You might wonder what happens if the right-hand side is sine omega t. That did come up on homework. But as far as our general analysis, does it affect things? Well, it, it must affect things somehow, but the question is how. So what if we had a sine of omega t, t there on the right-hand side instead of a cosine of omega t? The complexified equation would still be the same. You'd still put an e to the i omega t on the right-hand side for the complexified equation. Also, the associated homogeneous equation would be the same. You'd still have a zero on the right-hand side for that. The yh would still be the same. Don't forget about all that, by the way. If you want to find a unique solution to an initial value problem, or even a general solution, you've got to find the yh, too. Don't forget about that. Tracking with me? You'll remember on the test? you got to think about putting a zero on the right-hand side as well and finding yh. find eigenvalues of a matrix, or think about solving that equation for the quicker method for finding YH. Don't forget that. We're focused mostly on YP, though, which we find first by finding a, compl a complexified solution of this complexified equation. Maybe I should call it a complex solution. A e to the i omega t. You solve for A, 
What do we get in terms of P, Q, and omega? It's in here somewhere. This thing right here is what A simplifies to. That's not so simple, is it? Let me go ahead and write that out. I'll write it over here. A equals the real part is, put the first and third fractions together, Q minus omega squared divided by Q minus omega squared squared plus P squared omega squared. That's the real part. And the imaginary part is going to be minus I P omega over Q minus omega squared squared plus P squared omega squared. Actually, the imaginary part, when you say imaginary part, it's the part that's next to the I. It doesn't include the I. I've emphasized that before. Minus that is the imaginary part of that complex number. I've sometimes called this alpha and this beta. I'm including the I in that curvy brace here, so I'm writing that as beta I. Alpha is the real part, beta is the imaginary part. Beta includes the negative sign. <clears throat> Therefore, by the way, when we graph this in the complex plane, for us, in these problems, A is always below the real axis. It's down in the third or fourth quadrant. And the angle we typically take to be negative, the angle for A. And A does have an angle. It's got an it's got a modulus and an argument, a distance to the origin, and an angle with the positive real axis that we call absolute value of A or modulus of A and phi. We also call this capital A. And what did we see ultimately with all of this stuff? We saw that A, this complex number A, includes both the amplitude of the force response, the YP, and its phase angle. I say angle with quotes. It's not a literal angle except in this picture. It's not a literal angle on the graph of YP, but it does affect the horizontal shift. And you can think of it as relating to what fraction of a period you shift to the right to That still holds. What's new again in the case where we want sine of omega t on the right hand side? The new thing is what happens when you find yp? It's the imaginary part of yc, not the real part. yc again is a times e to the i omega t. Write that in terms of alpha and beta just to keep it simple. E to the i omega t is cos omega t plus i sine omega t. What's the imaginary part of that going to be? Is there a mistake? Just quick, no, just a quick question. Uh, what, what do the sub letters stand for on, on y and P? Like yp and yc and yh? Yeah, that's just. Notation, YH means homogeneous, okay. H. P. YC, C stands for complex, YP, P stands for particular solution of the original non-homogeneous accord. Got it. All right. Okay. It's just notation mm -hmm. to help us identify what we're working with. Yeah. Yeah. YP here is what we're after. We have to add it to YH to get a general solution of the original equation. Yeah. I think I've said that, but it's easy to forget. H does stand for homogeneous. C stands for complex. P stands for particular, particular solution of the original. So like not homogeneous. Um, force, like particular solution, or like that. Um, no, it's it's forced. Okay. Y P is a solution of this forced equation, this non-homogeneous equation. What's the imaginary part going to be? It's going to come from outside and inside terms from FOIL. Alpha times that, and beta I times that. 
without the i there, the imaginary part's going to be, let me put the cosine term first, beta cos omega t plus alpha sine omega t. What was it for, for cosine omega t on the right hand side? It was the real part of this, which was alpha cos omega t minus beta sine omega t, the minus sign coming from i squared. So the coefficients, in effect, get swapped, and um, they both become positive quantities in this expression, although beta itself is a negative number. So if we want to use this in our Mathematica stuff over here, this was how I wrote the yp when the right hand side of the original equation was cos omega t. Um, let me copy and paste this and change its name a little bit. Let's call it yp sine. Maybe I should call this yp cosine. By yp sine and yp cosine, I mean I'm specifying what the right hand side of the original equation is. If the right hand side of the original equation is cos omega t, then I'm going to use this formula. If the right hand side of the original equation was sine omega t, I'm going to use a new formula that I haven't created yet. I've got to switch the coefficients around make this cos coefficient the sine coefficient and make this sine coefficient the cos coefficient and then I gotta put a minus sign in front of one of these which one? let's see again beta is a negative quantity but when I write the symbols there symbolically in the board I wrote it as just a beta without a minus sign in front of it so symbolically, it doesn't have a minus sign, but in reality, it is a negative quantity. It comes from the minus p omega over that there, meaning I got to take the sine coefficient, which doesn't have a minus sign there, and put a minus sign there, and that'll be a that'll be a beta. I know that's confusing. Say it again. Beta itself is negative p omega over that. That's beta, beta itself with a negative sign. If you look on the board, that's the coefficient of cosine. However, I plugged sine coefficient in there without a minus sign. So I should put a minus sign there. I mean, it's kind of goofed up that way. Maybe I, maybe I should just use alpha and beta and include a minus sign here instead. But for the sake of time, I won't. Um. When that gets posted on Moodle, could you type that in, note it with text? Okay. Yeah. And I think I'll probably change it to alpha and beta. Okay. But for the moment, to save some time, I'll just do that. How's that going to affect things? Uh, let's see. Let's see. It, it really affects the phase angle. It doesn't affect the amplitude. Capital A is still the same. It affects the phase angle. Well, it doesn't affect the formula for the phase angle, but it affects how you interpret it. The graph of YP itself isn't the same. YP sine now. Oops. Did I enter that stuff? I don't know if I entered this. That's YP cosine. Here's YP sine. Let me put the cosine in here first. This is what we were looking at last Friday and noting that for small omega, the force response, the yp, is close to its peak at time zero, just like cosine is, is at its peak at time zero, right? The cosine function starts at its peak. But then as you increase omega, there's a shifting to the right in addition to a changing amplitude in such a way that it's a really a, uh, let's see, half a period shift. So you go from being close to the maximum at time zero to being close to the minimum at time zero. The phase angle goes down toward pot, negative pi 
that corresponds to half a period shift to the right, in addition to the amplitude changing. So you see it's close to its minimum there, time zero. What would happen if I did a y p sine instead of cosine? That means the right hand side function of the original equation, the forcing function, was a sine omega t. Now when omega is close to zero, it's starting near its average value, its midline, just like the sine function does at time zero. But as you increase omega, it shifts to the right by half a period. I, I should have said initially it was also has a positive slope there. It's shifting to the right, so it's still close to its average value at time zero, but now it's got a negative slope there. A small, but that's got a negative slope initially. So that's a half a period shift to the right because the phase angle is going to negative five which is halfway around the circle. Okay, so that's how it would affect things. Again, it doesn't affect the amplitude formula. What about um, including some other constant in front of this, like a three or a four or a five, or in general, maybe you want to call it capital B, making the amplitude of your forcing function different. I'll just quickly mention what would happen. Essentially, the A of the original one, the original A, gets multiplied by that same constant, capital B, because of linearity of differential equations. So if you multiply the right-hand side function by, say, 3, the amplitude of the force response increases by 3 as well. Should seem pretty intuitive. Everything gets multiplied by 3. You put a 3 here. I'll write it as a B. Oh, let's write it as a 3. You put a 3 here, 3 here, you'd get the A would be 3 times the other A that you can get without the, without the 3. It's a linear problem. There's a section in your book that I'm not testing you on. I did want you to read it. Um, it could be related to the project you decide to do for this class. We do have a project in here. The last three weeks of class or so, starting in about a week, you're going to be working on the project. It's related to a model, a simplistic model of suspension bridges. Oh, let's go ahead and watch this minute and a half video about galloping gurdy. My volume's doing. An old newsreel type of thing here. Tacoma Bridge, Washington, opened only a few months ago, was built at a cost cost of over six million dollars. But misfortune overtakes the great structure. These are some of the most amazing pictures ever recorded by. Volume's not supposed to go away. Only a 35 mile an hour wind is blowing, but this apparently sets up a rhythmic swinging of the bridge, which increases with each swing. Fortunately, the only casualties were a car stalled on the bridge and a dog. Uh, I think the dog would stay on the bridge. Okay, so there you have Galloping Gertie. Is that an example of resonance? Did that bridge collapse because of resonance? Was the forcing frequency of the wind close to the natural frequency of the bridge? Many people thought so for a while, but there are some problems with that way of viewing it. One problem is wind doesn't like dirty periodically. Right? It doesn't, not in at least a simple way. That's one problem with that. Another problem is that the physics of it is more complicated than a simple harmonic 
oscillator for one thing, you've got the first thing going on. It's something like a resonance phenomenon, but it's not a pure resonance phenomenon like we, we've talked about. It is more complicated. In the book, they discuss a sort of simplistic, it's still a simplistic model of the suspension bridge. And here we have a suspension bridge diagram. There's obviously forces going on, gravity's causing lots of things. You've got compression in the towers from the force of gravity. You've got cables under tension. Um, basically what happens, that's somewhat like a harmonic oscillator, but not exactly, is that when the cables get stretched, when the, when the bridge is lower than its equilibrium position, when the cables get, they can stretch and they, they act like a spring and they want to pull it back to equilibrium. But, but on the other hand, when the, when the bridge goes higher than its equilibrium, the cables don't act like a spring. They just get uh, kind of wavier. They get um, slack, right? They get some slack in the line. And they don't act like a pure a spring. So it's like they're a spring when they're stretched, but not a spring when they have some slack in them. And because of that, you have to modify your forcing function if you want to try to model it as a harmonic oscillator. And, and it is a simplistic model in other ways, too, because of the, you know, what about the twisting going on and that kind of thing. But it's worth trying to see what happens. Let y be the vertical position of the center of the bridge with y equal to zero corresponding to the position when the cables are taut but not stretched. So they, they're tight, but they're not stretched, so they're not going to pr provide a, a restoring force. The positive direction is upward. What forces are going on? You've got gravity. You've got some damping. You've got a restoring force of the bridge material itself, ignoring the cables. The bridge material has a restoring force because if you bend it, it wants to go back to its equilibrium. And then you've got this partial restoring force from the cable. It's restoring in the positive direction when y itself is negative. So you need a negative sign there to make it a positive quantity when y is negative. And it's zero when y is not negative. There's no restoring force when the bridge deck is above the equilibrium. Anyway, based on those forces, uh, and based on keeping things simple by choosing the units so that the mass is one, ha ha ha, what would that be in units? I don't know, you know, millions of kilograms or something. And letting h of y equal sort of the sum of these two restoring forces, the full restoring force of the bridge material and the partial restoring force of the cables, you can write h as a piecewise function as well. Uh, I think this is a tight word. This should be an a there. Where a is beta plus gamma and b is beta. You come up with a second order equation using Newton's second law. This is ma, m is 1. ma equals the force, sum of the forces. They're all in the opposite direction, so you get a bunch of negative signs. This is in the opposite direction as the velocity, this is in the opposite direction as the position, and g goes downward. You can rewrite it in a more standard form with zero on the right hand side and write the corresponding system. One initial interesting thing about this is that um, the equilibrium point's not at the origin. Naturally, the equilibrium position is when y is negative, actually. In other words, there's, because of gravity, there's sort of a natural stretching of the cables that happens. They are applying restoring force when they're stretching, but it's just exactly balancing gravity. Really. <clears throat> And that makes your equilibrium point at a spot where y is negative. What we see is you let time go by. Time is this capital B up here. You see an oscillation that is decreasing in amplitude because we have some damping. The, the amount of damping is small. That's why this is decreasing in amplitude so slowly. If I increase the damping, which is the alpha, 
I could make it get damped more quickly. Like that. Alpha is the damping. What are A and B? A and B were related to the behavior of the um, restoring force. One thing you might do if you do the project related to this thing is you might try to describe what the effect of A and B is. How it changes in A and B affect things. I'm not going to try to go into that right now. What's new? We might also add a restore an external forcing function. Wind, ha ha ha. Sinusoidal wind. Doesn't happen in reality. I experimented with this a little bit and found it difficult to find what the book was claiming in the reading. The book claimed that when you have this external forcing, that there's a periodic solution near the equilibrium point. And I've got to, well, actually, there is no equilibrium point. That's why I didn't include it. Because it's not autonomous, that equilibrium point doesn't really exist anymore because of the external forcing. The bridge doesn't st sit still. Uh, the book claims there's a periodic solution there that's a small amplitude. And I used locator, so you can change these initial conditions if you'd like. But I couldn't find what seemed to be a true periodic solution. They also claimed that if the external forcing had a big enough amplitude, lambda got bigger, and you cho choose your initial velocity to be fairly big, that there was another periodic solution where y stayed above zero all the time. I couldn't find that either. It doesn't really seem like we're approaching some particular periodic solution. It's sort of some sort of beating phenomenon, seemingly. But what I did find was that if land is large enough, and I'm not sure if this is a computer error or if this is reality, if land is large enough, it seems like maybe we have some sort of resonance. And on my computer, it also went out to infinity, but it doesn't seem to be happening in this My computer is less accurate. You have to experiment with this some more, but the, the main moral of the story from the book's perspective was that if, you're, if you've got this external free forcing, you can have solutions where y never goes back below zero. So that's going to be pretty extreme kinds of oscillations, is the point, when you have this external forcing. Whereas when you don't have external forcing, eventually, the, because of the damping, the solutions die off. The oscillations die off in amplitude. So that's just a little bit of experimentation, a little bit of a lesson about section 4.5. It's not going to be on the test. I would encourage you to experiment with it, with this if this interests you. It could be a project possibility. If you look at the end of chapters, they have labs. And I'm going to allow you to choose a certain lab from a list of possible labs for your final project in the class. And the one you do could be related to this, if it interests you. Okay, for the rest of the day today, let's think about nonlinear systems and let's impor most importantly think about this linearization idea. First, quickly summarizing what we already know. Okay, we've done this before. This is a predator prey system. Rabbits and foxes are the rabbits, is the prey. Their interaction with the foxes is negative. F is the foxes, they're the predator. Their interaction with the rabbits is positive to their growth. And we saw at the end of class that the phase plane looked like this. I added in the equilibrium points. There's three of them. How do you find those? Remember, you have to set the right-hand side functions equal to zero and solve the resulting system of equations. This is something you should be able to do by hand for this kind of example. So your system of equations, initially you'd write it as 2r times 1 minus r over 3 minus rf equals 0 and negative 2f 
plus 4 RF equals 0. That's a system of nonlinear equations. In general, it can be very difficult to solve. However, in this case, it's possible you can factor out a common factor of R from both terms in the top equation, leaving you, I'll also distribute the 2 through, with R times 2 minus 2 thirds R, and then don't forget about your minus F over there. With the second one, you can factor out a common factor of f. And you're left with negative 2 plus 4r. From this, you immediately see that the origin is an equilibrium point. If r and f are both 0, both of these equations are true. You also can get 0 pretty quickly in the second equation by noting that this will be 0 if r is 1 half. Right? Set just that part equal to zero. That will be zero when r is one half. And plugging one half into there helps you find the corresponding f. If r equals one half, plug that into the first equation, ignoring the r here. Plug it into that part. That'll mean two minus two thirds times one half minus f equals zero. 2 thirds times 1 half is 1 third. 2 minus 1 third is 5 thirds. Put the F on the other side. F is going to be 5 thirds. So the equilibrium point we've just found has coordinates 1 half, 5 thirds. And that is what Mathematica produced. 1 half for R, 5 thirds for F. There's another equilibrium point. It's easy to miss some others. If f equals 0, this can be 0. And if f is 0, r doesn't have to be 0 to make this top equation true. Ignore the r there. If f is 0, 2 minus 2 thirds r equaling 0 will also satisfy the top equation. And that will imply r equals 3. And that gives us our third equilibrium point at 3 comma 0. Mathematica produces them all, but you should be able to do that by hand. And we've done that in the past, but it'd be good to practice it again. So there they are, three equilibrium points. You should also be able to find no clients. This is the expression for dr dt in factored form. When is that zero? It's zero if r is zero, or if this part is 0, and that part being 0 can be solved for f as a function of r. If you set 2 minus 2 thirds r minus f equal to 0, you can solve that for f to say f is two, uh, minus 2 thirds capital R plus 2. In other words, a line with a slope of negative two-thirds and a vertical intercept of plus two. Let's put that in the, in the graph here. I could plot that line by hand by using that equation of Mathematica, since I already have the right-hand side functions in here, I could just use contour plot instead of solving for capital F as a function of capital, capital R. Let's just put the no lines in there with contour plot f of r comma f, okay, little f of capital R comma capital F equals equals zero. There's the r no line. Notice solutions are crossing with vertical tangents. Right there. Tangent line's vertical. There. Over here, tangent line still vertical, but pointing down. That's the R no line, analogous to the X no line. If you're going to draw a bunch of little hash marks on there, you'd make a bunch of vertical ones. It's not the only R no line, and if I make this uh, colored, you'll see it. It 
It actually also includes the f-axis. That's where r equals zero. So that's an r, r null claim as well. If you start on the f-axis, you stay on the f-axis. If the rabbits don't exist, the foxes die off. It's a straight line solution. What about the See, that's the R null claim. What about the F null claim? Change the little f to a little g to make it something other than red, green. That's where df dt is zero. Come back to the board here. This product is the expression for df dt. When is that zero? It's zero if f is zero, which is the r-axis, horizontal. And it's zero if this is zero when r is one-half, which is a vertical line. That r equals one-half, which is what we see now on the screen. Solutions cross that one horizontally. Actual crossing along here, along the r-axis, if you start on the r-axis, you stay on the r-axis, so you don't actually cross it. That should be emphasized. Because these null claims look like this, and because you could draw these by hand, that would be helpful in trying to draw this phase plane by hand. And in the next example, we'll try to draw it by hand without looking at the computer output. What's new? This idea of linearization is what's new. This seems to be, if you look at the entire uh, area around, it seems to be some sort of saddle point. This, it's hard to tell. Actually, it's a saddle point as well. Solutions are approaching in this direction and going away in this direction. This seems to be a spiral sink. How would you verify that with this linearization thing I keep alluding to? Well, for the origin, linearization can be thought about in a fairly simple way. Let's rewrite the equations here. dr dt. Let me go ahead and multiply them out, actually. <coughs> dr dt, if I multiply everything out, can be thought of as 2r minus 2 thirds r squared minus rf. And the FTT, if I multiply that out, gives me negative 2F plus RF, 4RF. Here's the basic idea of linearization near the origin. Get rid of any nonlinear terms. It's an approximation scheme. If R and F are both close to zero, if the point is close to the origin, then all these quantities are small. However, the things that involve squares effectively here or products of R and F here and here are really, really small. Right? If you square a small number, it gets smaller. Square 10 to the negative 6, and you get 10 to the negative 12th. Square 1 millionth, you get 1 billionth. Uh, excuse me, one trillionth. A million times smaller. I mean, they're both small numbers, they're both close to zero, but in terms of multiples, this is, this is, a, this is a million times smaller than that. Because of that, by getting rid of the nonlinear terms, getting rid of this term and this term, you get approximations that are pretty good. Get rid of that nonlinear term there, get negative 2f. In other words, when you're close to the origin, this nonlinear system acts like the corresponding linear system that I'm circling here. I should probably get rid of the equal sign around the approximately equal to, or excuse me, the circle around the approximately equal to. <coughs> Circle this equation here, this equality. Don't circle the approximation there. That is 
a corresponding linear system, if I think of those as equalities. That's a good approximation to the nonlinear system when you're close to the origin. What would the matrix for that system be? If you thought of R and F as being in order, R first, then F, the matrix is going to be 2, 0, 0, negative 2. Just look at the coefficients of R and F. A diagonal matrix, the eigenvalues are going to be right along the main diagonal, 2 and negative 2. Hey, one's positive, one's negative. It's a saddle point. Just like you see here. A saddle point. And moreover, since it's a diagonal matrix, if you found the corresponding eigenvectors, the eigenvector for 2 is going to be horizontal, like 1, 0, or any non zero multiple of that, corresponding to the fact that along the horizontal axis here, solution curves move away. They correspond to the positive eigenvalue. And the eigenvector for the negative eigenvalue, negative 2, is going to be vertical, corresponding to the fact that solutions along the vertical axis approach the point as t goes to infinity. But what about the other points? They get harder to deal with. And what you have to do is you have to create <coughs> the linearized system in kind of a strange way. Actually, it's not so strange once you get used to it. You have to create something called the Jacobian matrix. called J in a two-dimensional system it's going to be a two by two matrix the entries of this matrix are going to be partial derivatives the partial of the first right hand side function little f with respect to the first variable in our case that's capital R though usually it will be X and then the partial of F with respect to the second variable df df, usually that's going to be df dy. Then with the second row, you differentiate the second function, little g, with respect to the first variable and with respect to the second variable. As it stands, this matrix is a function. These partial derivatives are functions. How do you find them? If you've had multivariable calculus before, you know how to find partial derivatives. If you haven't found, had multivariable calculus before, we can still find partial derivatives. It's not too hard. To find the partial of this one with respect to R, treat the capital F like a constant. You'll get 2 minus 4 thirds R. Careful what happens when you differentiate that term with respect to R. You have minus F. The partial of that same function with respect to capital F, treat the R like a constant, you get 0, 0, minus R. Now go to the second function, the little g, differentiate it with respect to R, treat the F like a constant, 0, 4F. Then differentiate it with respect to capital F, treat the R like a constant, get negative 2 plus 4R. This is the general Jacobian matrix. It's a matrix valued function of two variables, R and F. Plug in any values of R and F if you want, you get a new matrix. How do we use it? We evaluate it at the equilibrium points. For example, the equilibrium point that was what? At one half, five thirds? Was that that one we found? R equals one half, F equals five thirds. Look right? Yeah, that looks right. You evaluate it at equilibrium points, just like with um, like a second derivative test for maximizing and minimizing, you plug in your critical points into the second derivative. Here, to try to characterize the equilibrium points, you plug them into J. To get a specific matrix, 
4 thirds times 1 half is going to be 2 thirds. 2 minus 2 thirds is 4 thirds. 4 thirds minus 5 thirds is negative 1 third. Check that in your head. I don't want to make a mistake here. I think that's right. Negative r is negative 1 half. Come down here, 4f is 20 thirds. And negative 2 plus 4r, 4r is 4 times a half is 2. Negative 2 plus 2 is 0. Looks like that's our Jacobian matrix at that point. Do you have a guess as to what its eigenvalues are? Not exactly, but what type of numbers they are? That points a imaginary spiral sink. Not going to be purely imaginary, but they will be complex with positive or negative real part. Say it's that? No, it's negative. Yep, negative. Negative real part gives you a spiral sink. Positive real part gives you a spiral source. Negative one third, negative one half, twenty thirds, zero. Eigenvalues should be complex with negative real part. They are complex, you see the eyes in there. The real part is negative one sixth. That does confirm, through a, a pretty heavy-duty theorem, uh, I'm trying to remember the name, I think it might be called the hartman grodman theorem or something. I should remember the name of that. Well, I'll get back to you, I think that might be the name. I haven't used, uh, thought about the name for a while. It's a spiral sink because the linearization, the Jacobian matrix at that critical point has complex eigenvalues with negative real part. If we linearize near this point, maybe we should do that quick, we got two minutes. R is 3, F is 0. <coughs> you have a guess as to what kind of eigenvalues you're going to get? Saddle point should get real eigenvalues, one positive, one negative. Plug in r equals three, f equals zero. Four thirds times three is three, or excuse me, is four. Two minus four minus zero, negative two. Negative r is negative three. Four f is zero. Negative 2 plus 4r is uh, negative 2 plus 12 is 10. That's an upper triangular matrix. Its eigenvalues are also on the main diagonal, negative 2 and 10. One's positive, one's negative, it's a saddle point. Okay, so I guess I didn't have time to do an example completely by hand. All of those, uh, I do have those supplementary videos. I would suggest watching a couple of them to get more examples. Trying to draw this thing by hand is definitely a challenge. Definitely the null clines are helpful. And by the way, the book doesn't get into null clines until section 5.2, but you may use them for 5.1. Drawing the null clines and then trying to use the nature of the equilibrium points, like the fact that this is a spiral sink based on this linearization, helps you try to draw these things. But it's, a, it's definitely an art, it takes a lot of practice. I will just end in 10 seconds here by saying that there are some examples where linearization doesn't work actually. Like when you have zero as an eigenvalue, and that's one case where it doesn't work. It actually also doesn't work when the linearized system gives you a center with purely imaginary eigenvalues. The linearization 
doesn't always work. It doesn't work in that case in general. You can come up with examples where even though the linearized system is a, SAS, is a center, the equilibrium point could be a spiral sink or it could be a spiral source. Okay? See you on Wednesday.